scars The world was on your heart completely Completely So I stand in awe in What's up everybody? So um and I've heard you, I've gotten the official word that you're not going back to school for this year. So I'm sure some of you are probably bummed and some of you are probably super stoked. So I can see both sides of that, being out of school and then also not being able to see your friends or say goodbye for the school year. So I'm glad you're here for lesson number three. Uh, just like the previous two lessons, Mr. Pibb's going to be with us again. P. Make sure you pause the video once you start it. Don't stop it. Come back to it. I, isolate yourself. Get somewhere quiet where you have your quiet time. Watch this. B, have your Bible with you. Other B, be ready. Be ready to share. Be ready to give. Be ready to be used by God. Okay, so lesson number three. Before we get started, I'll say a quick prayer. Father, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you for the calling that we have in our lives. Lord, I pray that you would help us to walk in that. Lord, open our ears, open our hearts to be receptive to what it is that you have to say. In Jesus' name, amen. So tonight, I want to start at the beginning. The visible universe contains more than 100 billion galaxies. Each of these galaxies has a diameter millions of trillions of miles wide, and each contains hundreds of billions of stars. Though incomprehensible, it is now estimated that the universe holds over a billion trillion stars. Long before the introduction of the telescope, Scripture declared that man would be unable to determine the exact number because there are so many. Of course, the Creator knows the exact number, and Psalm 147 declares that He even calls each star by name. The power to create each of these stars, the wisdom to maintain their stellar courses, and the incredible beauty displayed throughout the universe combine to affirm the Creator's majesty and care. God has made the universe so vast. All man can do is just marvel at this universe, the vastness of it. And I say, God, you are so, you are so great. And I think of what David said, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have made, what is man that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man that you should visit him? Well, it's estimated that there are over 100 billion stars in our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, it's estimated that there are over 100 billion galaxies in the universe. Which the Bible tells us that as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are God's ways above our ways and His thoughts above our thoughts. So chew on that for a little bit. Think about how big the universe is compared to the earth, which is just uh, the head of a pin by comparison. Just how big is God's universe? Traveling at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, we could circle the Earth seven times in one second. However, to travel across the known universe at the speed of light would take 28 billion years or more. Today, most astronomers acknowledge that the universe appears to be expanding. This also agrees with the Bible, which says God stretches out the heavens like a curtain. There are some examples in the Bible of scientific foresight. One example that comes to mind in particular is in Isaiah 40, 22, which talks about God stretching out the heavens as a tent or as a curtain. And you might say, well, that, you know, that is written in a poetic way, so we've got to be careful. And yet there are at least 10 other places in the Bible where it talks about this, this stretching out of the heavens. And that's something that uh, was only discovered in the uh, 20th century when we found that indeed all the galaxies appear to be, or virtually all of them, appear to be moving away from each other as if the entire universe is being, lo and behold, stretched out and expanded, just like the Bible says. And that's obviously not something that, that people could have observed in ancient times. That's something that had to have been revealed to them from above. 
unimaginably large, containing spectacular galaxies and stunning nebulae. Truly, the heavens declare the glory of God. So get your Bible. Let's turn to Genesis chapter 1. We're going to read two verses from Genesis chapter 1. We're going to read verses 1 and 2. Genesis 1 verses 1 and 2. It says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Now we know that this is the very beginning of creation. And we know that everything we can see, smell, taste, and touch was made in six days and God rested on the seventh. We also know that as God made man, he built a garden for man and everything was perfect. But something happened, something changed. And that something that happened is man willingly made a choice to disobey God and sin. And as, as, his, as man chose to sin, death came with it. So as we go a little bit farther in the story, we see God's people, the Israelites, are living in Egypt. Not living in Egypt under the greatest circumstances. As a matter of fact, they are now living as slaves. They're living as slaves and they're working as slaves for Pharaoh. And we also know that God chose a man to be the leader to bring those people out of bondage in Egypt. And that man is Moses. And Moses had himself had fled from Egypt to the Midian desert and was working as a shepherd. And as he was working as a shepherd, he noticed a bush that was on fire. Not just any bush that was on fire, but a bush that was on fire, but yet it was not consumed by the fire. And we all know that's where God spoke to him and God told him his plan. And his plan was, was to bring those people out. And after 10 plagues hit Egypt, Pharaoh reluctantly and then demandingly told the Israelites to get out. So they left. And we also know that the Egyptian, the, not the Egyptians, but the Israelites should not have been in the desert and wandering for 40 years. That was not God's plan and that was not God's design. But it was a choice they made. Fear and a disobedience led them to wander in the desert for 40 years. And as they're wandering in the desert for 40 years, God lets Moses know a desire that he has, and that desire is to dwell. So right around the first year that they're wandering in the desert, God speaks to Moses about this. And we're going to see that in Exodus chapter 25. So Exodus 25 verse 8, before we read it, just to back up a little bit, God speaks to Moses about some things that he desires the Israelites to bring to him. And those things are gold and silver and incense and oils and fragrances and fine linens and dried animal skins and dyes and all these things. Now was it was God wanting these things to add to some sort of collection? No. God had a plan for all this. So as God tells him to bring all this stuff, then God tells us what it's about. Verse 8, he tells Moses, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Now, in the Timnah Valley in Israel, several people have reconstructed a tabernacle. And this tabernacle is built according to the design that they know or they read in the Bible. And we can see the outer courtyard. We can see the brazen altar. We can see the, the tabernacle itself and the animal skins and the stakes that hold it in the ground. We can see where you can go in and all the furnishings are in there. The Holy of Holies is in there with the mercy seat. All those things are there and we can, we can see them. And this is what God desired to build. We see where God has told Moses, tell the Israelites to bring these things and this is what we're going to do. We are going to build a tabernacle. But God says, but you're going to build it exactly to the pattern that I show you, Moses. So Moses is the only one that has seen and knows exactly how it should be built. So Moses is overseeing this. So we're going to jump ahead 15 chapters to Exodus 40. Exodus 40, verse 34 through 35. 
So Exodus 40, verses 34 through 35, we see that the tabernacle is being completed. It's done. And Moses is inspecting, because remember, he is the guy that's overseeing this. He is the one that knows exactly what it should look like and how it should be. So as he inspects it and looks at it, and it is done, we see in verses 34 and 35, God shows up. And it says, Then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting, and the glory of God filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting, because the cloud rested above it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. We can see that God's desire was to dwell among his people. And we can see also that once this tabernacle is built, that God begins to fill that place with his presence, so much so nobody can go in there. So every inch of fabric is filled with his presence. Every dark corner and every area of that temple is now filled with his presence. God has the same desire for me and you, not for a building, but to fill our hearts and our lives, every square inch of it with himself. Now, when we start talking about the heart and God wants to fill our hearts with himself, that's a scary thought because me and you know what is inside of our hearts. We know the things that are in there, but do we really know what's there? So let's turn to Jeremiah. We're going to turn to Jeremiah 17. We're going to read Jeremiah 17 verse 9. It says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? You know, when I think of desperately wicked, I think I've used this illustration before. If you take a compass, that compass is always working and striving to find due north. No matter what you do, where you are, that compass is always trying to find north. And what we read right here in verse 9 is that the heart is desperately wicked. So think of your heart as not pointed toward always wanting to do what is right and what is holy and good, but to do what is selfish and prideful and wicked. That's the human heart. But as we've read here, who can know it is the last question. Well, who can know the human heart? Well, surely I can know my own heart and you can know your heart. But that's not the case. Our hearts have a way of deceiving us. Our hearts have a way of hiding themselves from us. So who can know it? What is the answer to that question? Well, Jesus gives an answer to that question. In Matthew 15, Matthew 15, verse, 9, verse 19, Jesus is going to tell us the state of the human heart. He's going to tell us what's in there. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. That's a pretty bad list. But me and you are not exempt from that list. There was a man who, who uh, was very wealthy and desired to play an instrument in the imperial orchestra. And the only reason he wanted to play in that orchestra is so he could rub elbows with the elite. So maybe he could meet kings and queens and monarchs. So as he, he goes to the conductor and he tells the conductor in a demanding way, I want to be on this orchestra. And the conductor, knowing that he's a wealthy man... He let him have a place on the orchestra. So the man is given a flute, and for two years he plays that flute. He moves his lips, does, moves his fingers, does all the things. He looks like he knows what he's doing, and nobody is none the wiser. Well, a conductor comes in after about two years, a new conductor, and he says, I want to meet with each person that plays in this orchestra. And for each person that plays in this orchestra, I want to meet with you one-on-one -on -one and I want to hear you play. I want to give you a tryout to see if you're good enough to stay in this orchestra. So the man shows up just like everybody else. And as that line begins to diminish and his time's getting closer and closer that he's now going to play in front of this conductor, he starts sweating bullets. He gets in there and he thinks, what am I going to do? So he tells him, he says, you know, I I'm feeling kind of ill. I'm sick. I don't really think I could do this. So they call a doctor. A doctor comes in and he says, I'm not seeing any symptoms. He seems fine to me. The doctor leaves and the conductor says, I want to hear you play. Let's see what you got. So as the man grabs his flute, he just says, forget it. You know what? I've been faking it. 
I'm not a flute player. I've wasted your time. I've just been faking it for two years. You know, when it comes to me and you, and the real me and you, our hearts, there's no faking it when it comes to God. There's no, there's no faking it when it comes to Jesus and because ultimately he sees past all that. There's no pulling the wool over his eyes. I've heard so many people, you know, kind of laugh and giggle about how they've, um, you know, snookered somebody or how they've pulled one over on their parents. God's not like that. You know, there's, there's nothing that, that he cannot see and there's nothing that he does not know. And even if it's hidden in the heart, he's going to see it and he's going to know. But the thing that is amazing to me is in God's infinite wisdom, he has chosen to dwell with his people. And not only that, he's chosen to dwell in us. And the place that he has chosen to dwell is in our hearts. But here's the mystery. How would that happen? Because we see in Exodus when God tells Moses that his desire is to meet a need for those people. And their, their need was to have God dwell with them. But as God relays this to Moses, he tells Moses, tell them to bring all these things so that we can build it. And Moses, I'm going to show you how it should be built. Well, how, what is it that me and you can bring? What is it that me and you can do? What is it that me and you could hope to achieve that God would come and live in our hearts? Is it found in gold? Is it found in money? Is it found in talents? Is it found in ability? Is it found in intellect? Is it found in wisdom? No. The mystery of how God would redeem his people and how he would redeem us for the story of salvation would be through his son, Jesus Christ. As God had decided that he would come down himself in flesh and he would bear our sin he would bear our sickness. He would bear our stripes. He would bear our shame. And it, so that, that would be the key to our hearts, to dwell in our hearts. So we can see that it wasn't something like the Israelites at the beginning where they could bring things to build a place. But God has said, I'm going to do something so that I can make your heart my home. Now, this is what we would call Holy Week. And Holy Week starts when you go back to Palm Sunday, which was last Sunday, where Jesus enters Jerusalem. And all these people are praising him, Hosanna, Hosanna. But these are the very same people in just a few days would be shouting, crucify him. And as we know, he's fast approaching Good Friday, where that debt is for me and you is fixed to be paid in full that that opportunity for God to dwell with me and you and for God to dwell in us was now going to become a reality because of what Jesus was going to do on the cross. And what he was going to do on the cross was going to be a completed work. Nothing added to it. It was going to be paid in full. thing that is so striking to me is, is that the, the Holy Spirit is the one that dwells in us. The Holy Spirit is the one that comes in to make a home inside of me and you. In Romans 8, 11, it says, The Spirit of Him who raised Christ from the dead now dwells in us. That that Spirit that was there now dwells in me and you. That that Spirit that was there on Resurrection Sunday is now the same Spirit that dwells in me and you. If we go back to the very beginning of creation, the video I showed you. Then when we talked, we read in Genesis that the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. That same Spirit that was there at the very beginning of creation is now in me and you as believers. So now let's go back to the tabernacle. We can see that as we go back to the tabernacle that God has had a desire to dwell with His people and we see that as the tabernacle is completed, he fills that place. You know, there's a writer who, on a whim, wrote a story of Zacchaeus. Now, we all know Zacchaeus from the Bible. Was a wee little man was Zacchaeus, and a wee little man was he, I think is how it goes. 
and Zacchaeus was a little guy, and Jesus was coming to his town in order to see him, he had to climb a tree to be able to see him. And as he climbed that tree, he could see Jesus coming. Now, Zacchaeus wasn't necessarily a real popular guy in that town because he was a tax collector. And those people were not, there weren't very many uh, Israelites that were friends with tax collectors. Not many Hebrews that loved tax collectors. So as he sees Jesus coming, Jesus looks up to him and calls down to him. And we all remember the story, Jesus goes to his home and Zacchaeus turns his life over to him. And he tells him, I'm going to you know, repay all these things and make everything right. And it's because he's had an encounter with Jesus. Well, this writer that wrote this little short story on Zacchaeus has picked up the story of Zacchaeus when he's an old man. Zacchaeus is an old man and he's venturing out into town. And as he's venturing out into town to get groceries and supplies and do things... There's a tree there that always captivates him. There's a tree there that he always seems to pause and dwell a little, stay a little longer. So one day, one of the shopkeepers notices Zacchaeus, and he finally asks him, he says, Sir, I see you come down these streets many times, and I see you every time standing beside that tree. I see you every time touching that tree, kneeling there, staying... with that tree a little bit longer. Why? Zacchaeus says, Sir, this tree is where I first saw Jesus. This tree is where I first heard his voice. And this tree is where I first realized that my heart would be his home. When life gets busy and we have routines and we have practices and sports and academics and girlfriends and boyfriends, we do have those things that compete. We do have those things and those desires and passions that seem to not leave a lot of room in there. And it kind of maybe pushes a little bit where God should be. But God's desire has never, ever changed, and that is to dwell and to dwell to the fullest capacity in your life and in your heart. And I'm afraid that because we get so busy with all those things that sometimes are not necessarily bad, that we lose our sense of awe and wonder when it comes to God and who He is. So during this Holy Week, I'm praying that we're reminded of three things. And those three things are that we're reminded of how great God is. We saw in the very beginning of that video, you look at the vastness of the universe and who am I? Who are we that God is mindful of us when He has made all that He has made? And me and you are just a speck on God's creation, but yet God is mindful of us. So number one, that we remember how great God is. And number two, that we would remember what God has done. God did something for us that we could not do for ourselves. As those people contributed items to build the tabernacle, there is nothing that me and you could do to make our heart a home for Him. Nothing. And lastly, number three, that we would remember that He dwells in us, not just with us, but dwells in us, that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. God, that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit that was there at the beginning of time, that was there on Resurrection Sunday is residing in me and you. I'm praying that Easter week is a week where all this comes flooding back to us. That first moment when we accepted Christ, where the beauty of divinity and depravity clashed. And all of that reminds us to not forget the great price that was paid for me and for you. That this Easter won't be like all the rest. That this Easter will be reminded that the Holy Spirit that was there at the beginning, that was there at Resurrection Sunday, is now in me. And the only way that has happened is through what Jesus has done on the cross. I love you guys. 
and I'll see you next time. Be